Thank you, James, and, and thanks to John and DP UK for inviting me to come and speak. I'm a little bit of a fish out of water because I'm a motor neuron disease, ALS, uh, clinician scientist, but I guess we're all part of the neurodegeneration family. So I'm going to talk about some of the really exciting developments that have happened in relation to MND. And you all know um, about MND. I'm going to skip through this slide very quickly. It is the commonest neurodegenerative disease of younger patients of midlife with a prevalence of six to nine per hundred thousand. It's considered a rare disease, and it is if you're a GP, but actually the lifetime risk of developing ALS is, is round about one in 300. So not as rare as you might think. Five to 10% of patients will have a positive family history. And of course, part of the reason I'm here is the strong links between ALS and frontotemporal dementia. Most people have symptoms for 12 months before they get to a neurology clinic. And in Europe, we have two licensed, minimally effective drug, uh, neuroprotective drugs, Rilusol and Adaravon. So there's a huge unmet need for effective disease-modifying therapies for this disease. I got interested in it when I was training in neurology because I just thought it was the worst disease in medicine and we knew nothing about it at that time. So we have this beautiful network of motor neurons coming out of the brain stem and spinal cord to connect with muscles. The axon of the motor neuron may be a meter in length and of course that, so it's a huge cell and stuffed full of neurofilament proteins. And as we've heard in earlier lectures, heterogeneity is a problem, and ALS is heterogeneous clinically, genetically, pathologically, and prognostically. And we have to take account of this in, in terms of clinical trials, directing the right treatment to the right molecular subtype of patients, as we've heard earlier. And we know from studying genetic forms of ALS that the process of motor neuron injury is complicated. At least 11 or 12 different things go wrong um, to contribute to the cell death of motor neurons. And it's not just the motor neurons themselves, but the crosstalk with surrounding glial cells as well that goes wrong. But I think we're at a very hopeful time in this disease. And we just, this, this is a nice collaboration between academia and industry. So with industry partners from two different companies, we wrote this um, article published just before Christmas in Nature Review's Drug Discovery. And it really goes through why we feel this is a neurodegenerative disorder poised for successful translation. So what do we need from biomarkers in ALS? So we need them to improve the subclassification of disease into its genetic and molecular components. We would like biomarkers which correlate with disease progression rate. We like to have biomarkers of target engagement and that uh, I agree with earlier speakers that's essential now in future trials. Um, and we would love to have biomarkers indicating reduction of motor neuron injury or therapeutic efficacy. So let's think about biomarkers of um, subclassification of MND. Genetics is the obvious starting point. So there are now at least 30 um, genes known to cause or significantly predispose to ALS. SOD1 was the first gene found, um, discovered in 1993, and I'll talk a little bit about the recent trials for that disease. And with advances in sequencing technology, a whole host of uh, new genes have been found. The size of the bubble indicates how common each gene is, 
and C9 off 72 is clearly the most common and very strongly linked with frontotemporal dementia. Just as luck would have it, most 97% of ALS is a TDP43 proteinopathy, but SOD1 disease is not. Um, and so all the models we developed for, for SOD1 disease in the early days, we expected therapeutic advances in those models to apply to the 98% of ALS patients who uh, don't have SOD1 mutations. So genetics, and I'll just show you an example from, we have a lovely program, three centers, Sheffield, UCL, and Oxford, where we do systematic biosampling from all newly diagnosed patients. It's called Ambrosia. I won't go through all the details, but they give blood in all its forms, urine, CSF, skin cells for reprogramming, and a proportion donate CNS tissue at the end of their illness. But as part of this, we could, on a research basis, screen um, the, the patients for all the known uh, ALS genes, and we screened a, a panel of 44 genes. This is just the first 100 patients into Ambrosia, of whom 7% had obvious autosomal dominant disease, but actually if we systematically screened the genes, 21% had a, had a clinically reportable pathogenic mutation, another 21% had a variant in one of those genes that we had to call of unconfirmed significance, but that was after removing benign changes and those present in controls. So that's a good starting point for subclassifying disease. And let's talk about the other biomarker priorities now. <clears throat> and to illustrate the, those in, in this very short talk, I'm going to give you insights. We've really learned a lot from recent trials. So I'm going to talk about the Tofferson antisense oligonucleotide trial and a recently completed EU uh, Horizon 2020 funded trial that isn't published yet, uh, but the results have been presented. So Tofferson antisense oligonucleotide for SOD1, um, the, f the, the first Interman study um, started uh, with a low dose of the ASO, building up as confidence built and safety was established to a maximum dose of 100 milligrams. 50 patients with SOD1 mutations around the world were included. And I want you just to look at the orange curve, which is the 100 milligram dose. So this is showing target engagement a lowering of the SOD1 protein in cerebrospinal fluid, neurofilaments that get released at very high levels in ALS as motor neurons are becoming injured, so phosphorylated neurofilament heavy, neurofilament light in the orange group of patients coming down beautifully in both plasma and CSF. This early stage trial was not powered to show definite efficacy, but all the measures, the clinical measures, so this is the ALS functional rating scale, breathing function, handheld dynamometry of muscle strength, you can see the stability in the 100 milligram treated group compared to uh, the placebo group in blue, and the dotted lines represent the fast progressing patients. So really encouraging results from phase one, two. FDA looked at this and said, just put some more patients onto the 100 milligram dose. So that was done in the phase three trial that was published in September last year. And here the results are a bit more complicated. So it was a, a larger trial, 108 patients. It was um, enriched with fast progressing patients in the US patients with the A4V mutation almost always die within about 12 months, and it was enriched for those fast progressors, and that may have scuppered us a little bit. So, but one of the uh, things that came out of this trial is that, and I won't go into the details here, but baseline neurofilament levels, and this is neurofilament light, are a better predictor of disease progression rate 
compared to what has been used as a standard, the change in the ALS functional rating scale. So neurofilament levels at baseline are important. The headline results from the phase three Valar trial, um, so the, the pr uh, primary endpoint was the change in the ALS functional rating scale at six months. The experimental period was six months, and then at six months, all participants had the chance to go on to the open label study. So uh, at six months, the functional rating scale showed a trend in favor of Tofferson, but it was not statistically significant. Uh, but it did um, show uh, highly significant reductions in the SOD1 level in CSF and the plasma neurofilament light, and I'll just show you those results. So the treated group in green, this is the lowering of the SOD1 protein, highly significant. The lowering of plasma neurofilament light, highly significant. But then, at six months, everyone goes on to the active treatment, and they were followed up for 12 months. And here, we're comparing in green the patients that went on to Tofferson from the beginning with those in blue who were on placebo to start with and then went on to Tofferson. And at 12 months follow-up, here the clinical indices are becoming significant. So significant changes in the ALS functional rating scale, in the breathing functions, uh, slow vital capacity, similar, and uh, the effect of muscle strength. And this is my favorite slide because here we can see improvement in muscle strength. And that correlates with what our patients were telling us. They were sending videos of themselves walking up the garden steps that they hadn't been able to do for two years, writing their Christmas cards this year, which they hadn't been able to do the previous Christmas. So this, I've done more than 22 trials in ALS. This is the first one where patients have reported improvement in their muscle strength or stabilization of, of their motor function. So I think what we've learned is we can find biochemical indices early. So reduction in SOD1 at eight weeks, reduction in neurofilament levels at 12 weeks. Um, but at six months, only trends showing slowing of clinical decline. With a bit more time, we can see significant improvements in motor function. And I think we should learn from polio. People could be devastated by polio, but once the virus had gone and the damage had stopped, remarkable reinnovation and improvement could happen, but that would take months. So motor neuron healing and reinnovation of muscles takes months. So the second trial is this um, uh, trial of, it's, so it's an anti-inflammatory agent, low dose interleukin-2 given by subcutaneous injection, five days per month. And the reason we did this is work from Stan Appel in Houston. He did a study showing that the higher the, T, the regulatory T lymphocyte count in patients' peripheral blood, the better their prognosis. Um, so what we were using low-dose interleukin-2 for was to increase the Treg count. And this was a study funded by EU, as I mentioned. So we did a very nice preliminary study called IMADELS. It was only three months long, three groups of patients, 12 on placebo, 12 on a lower dose, 12 on a higher dose of low-dose interleukin-2. And this three-month study showed that the drug was safe and well-tolerated, especially the high dose, the two million uh, unit dose, produced a very nice increase in Treg numbers, but also a decrease in an inflammatory marker, CCL2 or MCP1, as it's sometimes known. So that gave us confidence then to proceed uh, to a bigger scale trial. Um, but we also, in that original Imidel's trial, so this is a very talented young Italian scientist who did all the work, we took PBMCs from, that, from the Imidel's participants and we did gene expression profiling 
and based on the Treg count achieved, there were high responders and low responders. Everybody got an increase in Tregs, but some people did better than others. And what we found when we dissected out what determined a good or a less good responder, um, so all of the participants got a sharp down regulation of pro-inflammatory pathways, but the low responders to low dose IL-2 had a much more inflammatory phenotype at baseline. And then the, the big trial, 18-month survival study, 220 patients in France and various centers in the UK. Um, Gilbert Bensimon in Paris was the program lead. Nigel Lee from Brighton, the chief investigator. We took part in the trial in, in Sheffield. Uh, very much embedded experimental medicine into the trial. And I'm just, the, the results are complicated. They're not published yet but I'm just going to show you some brief um, headlines from it. So the Myrocals, the bigger Myrocals trial, replicated what I showed you in Imidals. So the Treg number, uh, the decreased inflammatory marker, very highly significant in this trial. And what we also showed in this trial, and this time it was phosphorylated neurofilament heavy rather than NFL, but the higher your phosphorylated neurofilament level at baseline, the worse your survival. So again, a good way of stratifying the severity of the disease at baseline. And then the overall results, so this was a survival study at 21 months, um, so the unadjusted analysis showed a 19% decrease in the risk of death in the treated group, but that was not statistically significant. But, but the pre-planned statistical analysis plan also allowed for an adjusted analysis based on the level of neurofilaments at baseline, and if you stratified for that, then there was a 73% decreased risk of death over the, the period of the trial. So um, I think stratifying uh, your analysis is going to be really important. So I've just skipped through um, what we've learned. I think we've learned a lot, and those are just two examples of recent trials that have really moved us forward, I think. Um, so in agreement with earlier speakers, new clinical trial approaches need to take account of the heterogeneity of the disease and always embed experimental medicine and biomarker components into the trials. Then you can learn from each patient that participates. Genetic screening for ALS is a, is a really good starting point for the molecular subclassification. We've still got to delve away at so-called sporadic ALS, and I think uh, there's a huge genetic component there as well, but it may be four or five elements rather than one autosomal dominant gene. We've demonstrated now biomarkers of target engagement, and the examples I've shown you are SOD1 levels in CSF, CSF and plasma neurofilament levels, uh, and based on a specific therapy, Treg counts and levels of the chemokine CCL2. And from two different trials now, neurofilament levels at baseline appear to be a robust predictor of disease progression rate, better than the functional rating scale that has tended to be used up until now. And biomarkers of therapeutic effic efficacy are beginning to emerge. These recent trials have shown neurofilament levels in CSF and plasma look very promising. If you've got something that's ameliorating motor neuron injury, you're lower, lowering those neurofilament levels. Um, so demonstration of reduced levels in response to a therapeutic agent may indicate that you are effectively protecting motor neurons. And what I also hope is perhaps using neurofilaments might enable us to pick out responder subgroups 
which we haven't been able to do before. And some of our trials where the overall results don't show a positive effect, there may well be responder subgroups in a heterogeneous di disease. So I think um, really very exciting uh, times ahead, not only for ALS, but for neurodegenerative diseases more broadly. To me, it's a little bit like the early emergence of antibiotic therapy for infectious diseases, I think in the next few years, we're really going to make very positive strides forward. Thank you very much for inviting me and for listening. Thank you so much. We do have time for some questions, some perfect timekeeping, so thank you. Are there any questions from the floor? One question. Yeah. This is on. Hi, I'm Amanda Hesselgrave from UCL, and thanks so much for that great talk. It's really good when you see good results. But one question: Do you think you can use neurofilament heavy and neurofilament light interchangeably, or was there a reason that there were different ones used in the different trials? Um, I think the MyraCals, the EU trial, started years ago. I remember writing the grant to the EU in 2014. So at that time, phosphorylated neurofilament heavy was picked because I think it was considered to be a more stable um, neurofilament biomarker. I think, um, so both, both seem to be effective. Um, neurofilament light is probably a bit easier to measure using an MSD system or a Samoa system, um, but both seem to be equally effective. There's one question there from John. Yeah, yeah. Pamela, thank you. you know, absolutely wonderful uh, talk. Um, one of the things that we really do need to do is uh, have, if you like, trials at pace and scale. And uh, through uh, MND Smart, you seem to have cracked that. Um, can you give us some hints? So, yes, w one of the, um, so uh, I think it's led by Siddharth and Chandran from uh, Edinburgh, and he linked with a group that had done um, uh, very successfully trials um, in, in prostate cancer. So there was a group of statisticians and so on that were, that were used to working through those adaptive trials. Um, so I think uh, the, there are huge advantages in maybe testing three or four drugs at once with a common placebo group. Um, the other attractive thing about MND Smart is the inclusion criteria are very open, and I, I get pleading emails every day from patients desperate to go into, MND patients desperate to go into trials, but they're not able to because they're, they're too long after symptom onset or they're too disabled. So the nice thing about MND Smart, everyone can go into it. Um, no matter how long your symptom onset, how, how long ago your symptom onset was, but the efficacy analysis will have a, a tighter group of patients earlier on in the disease course. So I think it's been a great source of hope for patients to be able to participate in trials. Um, I think um, the other thing about the MND community, so if you remember, we were all part of Dendron, that network that John Reed set up when he was Secretary of State for Health. And we persuaded John Reed to, and you'll forgive me, the dementia community, it was going to be just a dementia network. And we persuaded John Reed to open it up for patients with Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, and ALS. And the ALS community got together through Dendron, so we have a network of 21 centers that care for patients with MND. We have a monthly telephone conference to discuss clinical studies, trials, um, and it works really, really well. So for SOD1, 
um, disease, only 2% of ALS patients have a SOD1 mutation. But because of that network, Sheffield was the only center doing that uh, genetic therapy study. We got patients from all over the UK to come to Sheffield. So they came from Belfast, Glasgow, London, Cardiff, um, and it hi very highly motivated. Some of those patients have been having a monthly lumbar puncture for five and a half years to have their ASO treatment, and they're still coming every month from all over the country to have it. That shows um, what an effect it's, it, it has had. So I think that network, and it's more complicated in dementia, I guess, because you've got, uh, on the clinical side, you've got old age psychiatrists, neurologists, geriatricians, whereas for MND, we're only neurologists and we know each other very well. Smaller community. But I would really encourage that, and I'm sure you've got it through DPUK, just that network linking, um, helping each other out when you're looking at a rarer um, subtype of disease. It, it works really well. Um, so I think it, it works, I suppose MND Smart, and we're also setting up a European network called TriCALS. Tri um, it works because we know the community of clinicians and scientists know each other really well. A very highly motivated patient group to, they're desperate to, and their families are desperate to have the chance to go into trials. Um, and I think just utilizing the, uh, you know, the s s smart statistical way of running adaptive um, trials so that you get good data out of it. And there's a very good network also in the US based at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, uh, led by Merit Sokovitz. So yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's getting there and I, and I guess it's working as a model mainly because of the motivation of patients to you know, help develop better therapies. And they do it very altruistically. This may not help me, but it's going to help people in the future, maybe, if I do this. Thank you. And well, such a clear demonstration of the, the efficacy, the effectiveness of engagement and collaboration across the sector is a very good note for us to take a tea break. So can I suggest we move downstairs in a moment and talk to somebody you don't know. Look to the left, look to the right. Don't just pick the many friends and colleagues you have here, but, but find someone you don't know and approach them, please. And with that in mind, it's a great pleasure to thank once again Pamela Shaw. Thank you. Thank you.